we hope to do over the next 30 minutes or so is to illustrate something of the nature of Christianity today, uh, why it is as it is, and what the Bible has to say about the reasons that it is as it is. So the first statement we want to make is that we do not live in a world which is devoid of faith. 84% of the world's population are affiliated to a faith, identify with a faith of one kind or another. 5.8 of the 6.9 billion people in the world. And of those 84%, 33% identify themselves as Christians. So we have 1.6 billion people in the world who identify themselves as Christians. And we can see on the screen a map of the distribution of Christians throughout the world today. But in the UK, from the 2011 census for England and Wales, we see that 59.3% of the usual resident population, just over 33 million people, identify themselves as Christian. So that was in 2011 when the last <laughs> census uh, occurred of this nature. But we notice from the graphs on the screen that there has been a shift over the last 10 odd years between 2001 and 2011, a, de a decrease in the proportion of people who identify as Christian from 70 to 60 percent. We also notice that there is an increase in those reporting that they have no religion. And we notice also that there is an increase in uh, the number of Muslims um, in the UK. So these two, the increase of, of the those identifying as, identi as Isla Islam and, uh, and those which identify as having no religion are, account for the shift between 2001 and 2011. And uh, just for our interest, we notice that uh, the proportion in Stafford and in Rugby is slightly above the average uh, in the UK. But what does it mean then to be uh, a Christian? Because Christians are, are followers of Christ by definition. And some of the activities then that we would associate with those who are Christian might include coming and sharing a service together, uh, going to church, experiencing some kind of a Christian service, belief in the Christian God, reading uh, the Christian sacred text, the Bible, and worship of that God, and uh, trying to live their life according to the set of moral codes that we read in the Bible. That, I think, is what we could logically assume uh, of those who say they are Christians. And so for the next few minutes, I'd like to just explore two of these aspects, church attendance and Bible readership, to see um, whether Christianity today is as the Bible dictates. So in this graph uh, on the screen, we can see that there has been a clear decline in church membership, if you'll consider church attendance uh, first for a few moments. And there's been a clear decline then in church membership from the 1900s. Uh, and this, the, the data for uh, this graph is taken for Church of England from um, parish registers uh, and attendance <laughs> records for uh, Catholics and other denominations. And, and the graph shows that there is a decline and that the current level of those who are regularly attending church is far less than the roughly 60% of those who in the 2011 census ticked the box to say that they were uh, Christian. You can see that roughly 2015, uh, that only 10% of the population in England and Wales attend church on a regular uh, basis. So this is perhaps one good indication of an aspect of Christian practice. So how does it compare with the Bible? We look at two passages uh, together which speak about attendance at church, essentially, you know, or in essence. The first is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you'd just like to turn to that passage. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and uh, the context of this passage is that Paul is writing to brothers and sisters uh, Christians at 
Corinth, and he has heard that the Corinthians have problems when they meet together, different groups and in different sizes, and that there is a division within that church because some have more to eat than others. And Paul explains in this passage exactly what they are doing when they meet together. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 22. What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. But I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So in this passage then, we read that these are some instructions given by Christ that they should come together, that Christians should come together to meet and to have a meal with bread and wine, which represents Christ's body and his blood. And it is an act which is instituted by Christ, and Paul is passing this message on to the Corinthians about how they are to remember his sacrifice. And the point we want to take from this passage is that we have here instruction to meet together. We're not uh, particularly interested in the, in the particular problem of the Corinthians and how they weren't doing this correctly. The point is that part of what it seems to be to be a Christian is to be meeting together to remember Christ. Now we have a, a second passage then, another example of this in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, which is on the screen. And this passage that we've read together is describing the activities of the very first followers of Christ. And we read in this passage... Then they that gladly received his word, the word of the Lord Jesus Christ, were baptised, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So we notice several things from this passage that the early converts to Christianity did. They continued in the doctrine or the teaching of uh, the apostles. They broke bread in houses, just as we have read that Paul instructed the Corinthians to do. Uh, so they were meeting together on a daily basis, and they were remembering Christ, uh, as, as we've just read in 1 Corinthians. So these two passages then, together, paint quite a different picture of the type and the level of commitment of Christians in the first century, and compared to that the difference between the 10% that regularly attend church from the data that we looked at and the 60% that identify as Christians. And unless those 50% difference from meeting and uh, discussing the Word of God together uh, in the way that we read, Christians have been instructed to do in their homes, then we would suggest that there is a difference, a fundamental difference between the behaviour of Christians described in the Bible and in these passages, and those that ticked the 2011 census box. So let's have a look at another aspect of Christian behaviour, uh, Bible readership. And this, we have suggested, is another activity that we would expect Christians to be doing, to be reading or to be studying the Bible. And this is harder to measure statistically, but to share a few statements from the Bible Society, which is a 
a fairly reputable online community which has had several different uh, surveys commissioned. And these are statements which are based on surveys which are uh, conducted by YouGov. And this is a survey of roughly a thousand parents and children on their understanding of Bible content. So these are not necessarily Christians, but these are residents of the UK. So of, the ch of children surveyed, uh, children uh, counted as those under 15, almost one in three, 29%, did not select the nativity as being part of the Bible. 36 did not recognise the Good Samaritan. 41% the, the story, the narrative of David and Goliath that's coming from Scripture, and 59% Jonah. And almost 10% thought that Hercules was in the Bible. And then parents asked a similar set of questions when they were asked uh, to decide whether a series of plot lines were in the Bible. Almost half of them, 46%, failed to recognise the plot of Noah's Ark was in the Bible, that it was a Bible story. And that almost a third, Adam and Eve, 30% as being from the Bible. So this is one source of information then that would suggest that Bible knowledge is lacking amongst the general public. But that is the general public, it is not necessarily those who call themselves Christians. But another survey, which uh, again was conducted by YouGov, raised several interesting points. Because this was to both congregations of churches and to church leaders. And the data, uh, the, uh, the summaries of the surveys that were conducted, first amongst the congregations, regular attenders of church, at church, revealed that there was a hunger for gritty, in-depth biblical analysis rather than leaders going through the motions, that there was a hunger for explanation rather than repetition, and there was a wish for a broader understanding of the Bible's main themes rather than learning texts by rote. And then it was also thought that church leaders had a key role to play in making the Bible accessible to their congregations, that they should spend the time that the congregations did not have and that the church leaders did have because it was their job uh, in explaining that their con the Bible to their congregations and ensuring that they understood it. And similar things were revealed uh, for surveys which were conducted with church leaders. A common theme that was revealed was that there was a sense of dissatisfaction that sprang from the fact that church leaders regarded the Bible as very important uh, and very much relevant to their own lives and to the lives of their congregations and essential uh, for their spiritual development, but they felt less able to communicate that to their congregations because their understanding wasn't strong enough by their own admittance. And interestingly, this survey uh, of this, this level of uncertainty about the Bible and what the Bible was really about is perhaps reflected in the uh, answers to questions about why the Bible is relevant that we have on the screen. So these are the highest proportion uh, of commonality of answers for why the, the Bible is important from the same set uh, of uh, surveys that were conducted with the same congregations and church leaders. And we see that the most important reason that it was that it was thought that uh, the Bible had value, was that it had values for a good life. 60% of those surveyed. Then the next was uh, that it was important to English culture and history. Uh, just uh, over 50% of those surveys thought that this was the one of the main reasons for the value of the Bible. 40% uh, just over uh, thought that they were classic stories in the Bible that stood the test of time, and uh, just under 40% uh, spoke about the posterity of, that these stories should be handed on to uh, future generations. So from this information then we can perhaps summarise that there is a lack of Bible knowledge, there is perhaps a desire to increase that knowledge, 
there is the understanding that leaders should help explain the main Bible themes rather uh, than just teaching passages or learning by rote or repetition, uh, but that they are currently un inadequate to, uh, to help out in this regard. And finally, the reasons for reading the Bible, that it is primarily about leading moral lives, but also that it has certain cultural and, uh, and historic value. So what then does the Bible say about why we should read it? Well, again, we shall consider a couple of passages together. And this is a passage from Romans chapter 10. So from verse 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as I have said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. So this passage then describes for us a process in reverse, a process which begins in the passage with salvation, and says that belief is required for salvation, and to believe, people must hear, and what they are hearing, uh, or what they are being preached, uh, about to uh, is those things from the word of God. So this passage by itself then seems to highlight a far more important reason for reading the Bible than a set of moral values or classic narratives. This is about life or death or salvation, about being saved. And whatever uh, constitutes for Christians, salvation, and we're not, that is not the, the theme of, uh, of this afternoon's uh, address, requires, we see, the word of God. It is directly linked to faith, to belief, uh, uh, to being saved. Let's look at another passage, Romans 15, verse 4. And this says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So we have identified through the brief statistics that we've looked at that suggest that there is certainly a requirement, if not a desire, for a better understanding of the word of God, of the general themes of the Bible. And this passage then is interesting, and we're taking it out of context, but the context speaks of supporting uh, one another within uh, a Christian community and basing our lives upon the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this passage then states the importance of paying heed to everything that we read in Scripture. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And uh, another passage, which we'll look at in a moment, refers to all scripture being profitable. And this passage then says that these words are important for our learning, why? That we might have hope. So both of these two passages that we've looked at seem to infer that what the Bible is good for, as it were, what it is helpful for, is something related to hope and to salvation. I would suggest that these concepts are forward-looking, uh, depending on our understanding of salvation and human nature, but both passages certainly highlight the Word of God as important uh, in relation to salvation and hope. Let's just uh, look at a final passage uh, on Bible readership, Acts chapter 17. We read in Acts chapter 17, that the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed also of honourable women which were Greeks, and of men not a few. 
And what we want to draw from this passage is the importance of personal reading. We remember in the statements that were made uh, by Christians that there was the, the suggestion that it was the leaders of the churches which had the responsibility to teach their congregations uh, the word of God and its, and its messages. But we see in this passage that um, this is not necessarily the case. And this may uh, seem to be supported by the passage that we've just looked at, which speaks about the word of God uh, being preached. How shall they hear without a preacher? But if we think about the historical context of that passage, then perhaps the need for a preacher was greater then than it is uh, now. Because, of course, the, in the first century, the, the canon of scripture was not complete, uh, and literacy levels were not as high as they are now. We couldn't just go down and buy a Bible from our local bookstore. This, well, there was a greater requirement for preachers to spread the gospel, and this passage is talking about that. It is talking about the initial dissemination of the gospel message. It's not talking about established Christian communities. But as we have just read in Acts chapter 17, we see that even there in the first century, the members of the Berean uh, Ecclesia were commended for being more noble than those in Thessalonica because they read and searched the Bible, the Word of God, the Scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. They were commended because instead of just taking by rote those, the teachings of Paul, they searched for themselves to see whether the things that they were being taught were as the Bible uh, taught. It was the Bible that they were taking as their ultimate authority. And this passage then highlights the value of individual Bible study, personal Bible study. And if we think about the subsequent course of human history, for the next 1,500 years and, uh, and past that time, Individual study of the Bible has actually very often been discouraged. And it's been seen, just as was understood in those surveys, as the exclusive domain of the so-called leaders of the churches. And in fact, throughout many periods in history, we have record of terrible persecution of people that have tried to read their Bibles for themselves by church leaders. Uh, because they did not want to see whether those things were so. They did not want to allow their congregations to see whether those things that they were being taught were so. Perhaps because those things that they were being told and taught uh, were not as the Bible teaches. So today people in England then are not persecuted for reading the Bible, but there does seem to be an astounding ignorance, a self-proclaimed ignorance about what the Bible teaches the fundamental, fundamental messages of the Bible. What is the Bible's real value then? Is it really because it has classic stories or is it because it relates to salvation and hope, those words that we picked up from the passages that we read together? And why is it that people rely so heavily on church leaders for their understanding of the Bible? When this passage that we read together uh, teaches us the importance of reading it for ourselves. Well, for the last few minutes of the talk, we're going to briefly consider a few reasons for the declining readership and look at a couple of things that the Bible says on this topic. But before we do, just uh, put up this passage that we've already referred to, which speaks about the importance of all of the words of God that really provides us with a perspective on, on the things that we're going to look at in a moment. So we read in 2nd of Timothy chapter 3 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And this is really then the ultimate claim that the Bible makes about what it is, that all of it, all of the words that are given uh, by inspiration of God. These are not the words of man, but these are the words of God. And this verse also tells us the use of these words for the reader is for doctrine or for teaching, for reproof 
and correction and for instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be perfect, that he might be complete, that he might be all that he can be in the sight of God, that he might be of value to God. And this is a very bold claim that the Bible makes. But if it was believed and understood, and if it resonated with those that would profess to be Christians and to take the Bible as a holy book, then we would expect a far greater attention to be paid to the Bible than is currently shown. So what then are the reasons for unbelief? Just look at one passage in relation to this, which is a parable from uh, the Gospel of, according to Matthew, in chapter 13. I'd just like to turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. And this passage is a picture or a parable of how different people read the word of God and then how they receive it, how they react to it, and it presents four categories of people, and it presents a very apt picture of what happens to people when they read the Bible. So let's read from Matthew chapter 13 and from verse 3. And he, the Lord Jesus Christ, spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. And some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground, and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And then uh, from verse 18, we have the interpretation of this parable. Hear ye therefore the parable of the Son. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So we read here that of these four categories, the hard ground represents those who are hardened by sin. When they hear the word of God and they do not understand the word, but the wicked one, Satan, that nature within that person which naturally fights against the word of God, rejects those things point blank. They are outmoded. They don't understand them. Uh, they see them as old-fashioned. And the message is plucked from that person before uh, it can make an impression upon them, keeping their heart dull. And this picture, then, this, these verses describe the vast number of people in England. They do not have a, a first clue as to what the Bible has to offer, and it is seen as irrelevant because it is not understood. The second category, then, are those who at first profess a delight in the word of God and an engagement with it, but their heart is not changed by it. The word does not have an, uh, a lasting effect upon them. And so when trouble arises, their so-called faith very quickly disappears, and they're willing to go so far in their commitment until they realise that their commitment involves more than just ticking a box on a census. When they realise that they have to read, they should read the Bible daily to search out, to see whether those things are so, and whether they, and when they understand that the Bible speaks about how they should behave and how they should worship God. And they decide that actually the Bible is not really for them. 
The third category of people then are those that receive the word, but whose heart is full of riches and pleasures and lust, the things of this world, which take away their time and their attention from the word of God, and they therefore have no time for the word of God. We remember the attitude in the survey which spoke about the leaders who have more time should apparently be the ones who are teaching their congregations about the Bible. But this, of course, is not as we have seen. This is describing those who have no time for the Bible. And then, so finally then, we have briefly painted a picture of the state of Christianity today in the UK. And we have seen evidence that those identifying themselves as Christians are not really adhering to the standards which the Bible says they should be adhering to, or the practices which are prescribed in the Word, which is, after all, the sacred text of Christians. And we have seen that it is the, the holy or the sacred text because it declares that these are the words of God. These are not the words of man. And it is only by engaging with these words that the man of God can be perfect or complete, furnished, able to bring forth good works unto God, can be, of a val can be of value to God. And this brings us to that fourth category in Matthew chapter 13. Those who receive the words of the Bible and those who understand because they take the time to read and to understand and who do not reject the words. They're not offended by them those who do not see the things that they are being taught as a hindrance uh, and who do not reject the word, those who are not caught out in their miscomprehension of it because they take the time to see whether those things are so and they read it carefully and then are committed enough to it that they are not distracted by their commitment to other things, by the cares of this life. And these then are described as the good ground, those that hear and understand and receive the word of God and then allow the word to accomplish that which God intended it to accomplish in their life, the perfection of their character in the sight of God, a character that is faithful to him and that which we have seen, faith, is a prerequisite to salvation. So what we have seen then is that there does seem to be a difference between how the Bible is perceived by everyday men and women professing to be Christian and what the Bible says as the Christian text about what the Christian's interaction with it, with the Word of God, should be. And so if we have any designs or any interests in understanding what it is to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, all the challenges and the trials, but also the hope, the salvation that the Bible promises, what the future holds for those who are truly committed followers of the Word of God. And we should recognise the importance of the Bible and we should take its messages and its teachings very seriously indeed.